is um, for prevention only and it, again it's for education and awareness and it's not a guarantee that just because you hear this really short presentation you're going to be 100% safe. Uh, this is just for education and awareness. So who's committing crime, who's committing identity theft, who's committing all sorts of identity crime online and in the real world? There's a, a full range of people doing that. And it ranges from the simple opportunists right through to the very sophisticated organized people, the organized crime groups that commit crime uh, again in the real world and the virtual world. It could be simple opportunists, the people that roam through the hallways in the high rises downtown. It could be in, in buildings like this. They'll try doors, they'll try rooms, uh, they'll look for gym bags, jackets, uh, purses, wallets, laptop computers, things like that, items like that. And they are the opportunists. Um, they also commit identity crime. It can be the um, people that uh, are organized, the ones that are looking to do maybe the phishing exploits online. So it, it really is a wide range of people committing this type of crime. It also includes the people that you know, sometimes the people that come into your home. Uh, they could be roommates, they could be guests, they could be disgruntled spouses, uh, people that know a lot about you and they run into problems, maybe gambling problems or addictions of some kind and they need to um, use your information to commit some type of crime to get money. So how popular is identity crime? It is one of the fastest growing crimes on the internet. Uh, in the real world, it is uh, one of the fastest growing crimes in North America, mainly because there's just so much information out there about each and every one of us. And so it is a crime that's relatively easy to commit. Uh, how does it happen? Well, people are able to acquire key pieces of information about you. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we say it's your name, your address, your phone number, your social insurance number, your mother's maiden name. Uh, those five pieces will get you uh, possibly a bank account, possibly a, bank, um, a credit card application. Um, but there's really about 40 different kinds of what we call PII, personal identifying information. And that could be an email address. That could be um, the school that you go to. It could be your passport number, and it goes on and on. There's a lot of different kinds of PII. So as I go through this presentation, I will be speaking about that. And uh, what is it? Well, it's the use of a person's individual personal identifying information to then um, go and try to get credit, uh, use their information to get money, to get credit or merchandise from them. And of course, it's unauthorized. Hassle's the biggest part of this crime. It's very, very abusive. It doesn't just happen <laughs> once, it happens every time you go into the bank to maybe get a mortgage or get a loan. You have to then give them your police case number and say, no, I was actually a victim three years ago. Um, no, that wasn't uh, me that borrowed that money from you. It was somebody else. Somebody had applied and uh, used my credit and my name to commit that crime. So it can be very, very abusive. On average, it takes about 14 months before you even know that you're a victim. Unless you're buying a house or a car every year, you may not find out unless you go for a credit bureau check. So I'm gonna start by providing ideas for sources of information to commit identity crime, and then focus on the prevention part of it, how you can actually prevent this crime from happening. So I'm gonna start with what we carry around with us at all times usually in our purse, in our wallet, is our information, our identification. So our name, address, usually is located on, on some form of ID. We want to slim that down, carry just absolutely what you have to carry at any given time. So uh, one low-level credit card. If you're carrying around your um, social insurance number, well, memorize that number and then leave that card at home because you don't need to show it to anybody. Um, again. Uh, know what's in your wallet so that at any given time you can, if you lose it, uh, phone people, advise people what exactly was in your wallet at that given time. And so what we'd recommend is that you put all of your ID on a photocopier, um, again, um, get a copy of that, put that copy in your desk at work, don't carry it around in your wallet with you, so that you can cancel all of those cards. And again, that might be um, driver's licenses for sure. 
Uh, of course, you're going to cancel your credit card. But what about the other pieces of ID that you might have in your wallet, such as your you know, Safeway card, your co-op card, your library card? What about those pieces? Well, at least you know that now you've lost them. You know what the number is so that you can advise those organizations that you have actually lost your card. Because it is easy enough for people to go onto the internet they can Google or use some sort of search engine uh, to search out fake ID and up will pop many different websites that produce fake novelty secondary uh, identification which they will provide to you. And it looks pretty good. Um, it may have holograms on it. It may have scan barcodes and they, they can get it in your name. So again, somebody can be out there using identification that looks pretty good but it's actually in your name. And then they may be able to get a credit card application. They may be able to get um, a cell phone. Maybe get, um, um, give that to a landlord to get an apartment. Maybe get a mailbox and then they reroute your mail so you don't even know that it is being used. And that's basically how they start doing it. You know, when people present identification to you, you want to look at that, um, ask questions until you feel very comfortable with the answers uh, because, you know, again, it's, it's easy enough to uh, produce some secondary novelty fake ID, which is what they sell it as. Uh, another source of identification about people is, um, is just what we throw in the garbage. And there are people out there that are looking in the garbage at your house, behind businesses that oftentimes will throw things out without shredding them properly. And um, it's very, very important that, of course, we invest in a cross-cut shredder, something that will make the very small little confetti pieces uh, rather than those long strands of paper, because those long strands of paper have been known to be taped together. Um, so again, uh, cross-cut shredders, we want to make sure that we don't throw, you know, emails, letters away, um, any type of identifiable information that maybe has financial or sensitive or confidential information in it. Very inexpensive to buy a cross-cut shredder these days and they make great presents for people. Uh, again, if you're getting rid of your laptop computers, um, your cell phones, any devices that uh, contain information on the hard drive, you want to remove that hard drive from your laptops, from your PCs, prior than donating or having, you know, getting rid of or disposing those computers. Uh, um, that's where all the good information is, of course. And um, if you're getting rid of your Blackberries and your smartphones and, and such as well, remember that we want to make sure that we get, get that information off. So you can have it professionally wiped clean um, or you can actually remove the hard drive and keep those um, uh, rather than just given, giving them to somebody else to get rid of the, do the information that's on the hard drive for you. I'm going to move into the online world and just give you a, a snapshot of what's going on online because a lot of the identity crime that is happening these days is happening in, um, on, the, um, on the online world, I guess. And it's because there's an underground economy. You can go to many different websites and you can buy fishing kits. And I'll tell you a little bit about fishing as we go along here. You can buy skimming devices. You can buy just about anything that you want to commit crimes in the underground economy. Um, <clears throat> this is called phishing. And really, it's the backbone of identity crime online. It started about 15 years ago, I'd say. And uh, it's become far more sophisticated than it was 15 years ago. I remember when we used to get these, uh, you usually get them through email, they would be, um, there would be spelling mistakes, grammatical errors, extra spaces between words and, and letters. And they're much better now. They will look like the legitimate organization. They will look like a bank. They will look like a retailer or an ISP. Or they could look like a charitable organization like Oxfam or, or Red Cross because they have been fished. They've been victims of phishing themselves. And their logos and their brands have been stolen by these groups of people. 
they will send millions of these things out and of course what they're hoping that you will do is put in your username and your password or possibly your credit card information. Uh, of course we never want to do that. We want to delete these when we receive them and specifically we don't want to click on any links on the page because nowadays these are infected with malware. So if you by chance click on a link, your computer may become infected with malware, a bot that will sit in your hard drive and it will act like a human and steal all your keystrokes. Send your keystrokes back to the bot master who's in this command and control server that's gathering all your keystrokes with your usernames, passwords, credit card number, anything they want. This is another one. Uh, recently, one of the top searches on Google was Kate Middleton's dress. And everybody wanted to see what her dress looked like. So, of course, we click on one of those images, and what happens is we get this pop-up that says, warning, your computer is infected with a Trojan. Then all of a sudden we get this um, happening and it's actually scanning your computer and it's showing that you've got 332 Trojans and 65 Trojans on the D, on the D drive. So um, this is called scareware because it's exactly what it does. It scares you. And they will phone you up and say, you have a virus. Um, so they're using scareware tactics, which is exactly this. They want to sell you fake antivirus. And of course, what's the next thing that happens is either you say, I don't want it, you hang up on them, or in this case, you delete it, but you're still kind of curious about this antivirus. So you maybe are going to Google it. What ends up happening is it works their search results up higher in the search results. And of course, when people want to buy antivirus, that's one of the top searches that comes up. So that's the scareware scam. Again, you know, hanging up on these people when they call you and of course deleting um, any of these kinds of emails. Um, Google, if you're on, you know, if you do use Google as your search engine, they are always searching for drive-by downloads of malware, those kinds of things, and they will notify you. They'll say, warning, warning, uh, this site may harm your computer, don't go to it. And they're always, of course, looking at the images as well. So this is interesting now. Um, these kinds of websites, you maybe are interested in buying something or um, using some sort of escrow service. Uh, oftentimes, the cyber criminals will try to get you when you are pulling your credit card out of your wallet, you're entering that kind of information online, that's when you're most at risk. Same as in the real world, you know, with, with your credit card, with your money, you're most at risk when you're carrying it around with you and going to pay somewhere. So they know that and that's when they do target you. So in this case, they've used a website such as this, which is an escrow service, and they know, of course, you're probably going to be using your credit card at this time. If you look at that website, you'll notice right away there's a spelling mistake. Um, they, they're a lot more sophisticated these days, but you will occasionally still see those spelling mistakes on some of these websites. Um, best idea is if you are going to do any kind of financial or sensitive or confidential transaction online, rule of thumb is you go to the website yourself. Don't wait to come for it to come to you. If you receive an email sent to you via, um, from your friend that says, hey, check out this new sale at Amazon or the iTunes store or Expedia or something like that, here's the link. Well, you want to go to that site yourself. Don't just follow that link to get there. So of course, you want to always put trusted sites up into your favorites or bookmark them so you don't have to actually type them in each time. Of course, look at the URL. Make sure that it is the site that you're going to. Sometimes they are just um, a few letters off. The other thing is if you are going to be putting any uh, credit card information, personal information on a page, you always want to look for that um, secure socket layers, which means that they're using encryption. Uh, you'll notice that it goes to HTTPS. So that's what you want to see. You want to see HTTPS on any web page where you're entering personal, financial, sensitive information. You'll also see a padlock. 
either open or closed. When it's closed, it means that it is an encrypted page and your information from point A to point B in between there is going to be encrypted. That's what you want to see. Now, if you only see a padlock and you don't see the HTTPS in the URL, um, the padlocks have been spoofed. So you don't want to just go by a padlock. I'm um, going to move into the uh, social media. This is really an area where there's a lot of personal information that gets posted onto the internet. And this is where a lot of criminals are looking. They're data mining. They're looking for information. And they can put it all together. Um, they can find out information about you. And then they can put it together and then uh, gain apply for credit. Um, if they've got enough, they can sell that information. And that's why we're hearing about more and more often about these hacking incidents where people are stealing. They're targeting areas on the internet where there's a lot of personal information that's stored. So now they're, uh, uh, I guess, attacking companies that gather information about us because those are real, you know, valuable uh, targets. And then they go online and they sell that information. Just want to really quickly mention that if you have kids online, 13 is the minimum age for Facebook. And a lot of times the kids have these Facebook accounts and they're not mature enough, responsible enough to understand the kind of personal information they put online. So um, not that 13 is, you know, all of a sudden you're mature, but um, it is the, uh, the minimum age that Facebook has designated that they're willing to take the risk to have you as a customer. And I get a lot of phone calls actually from parents that say, gee, my kids um, decided to invite their friends over on Friday night and 300 people showed up because they you know, posted on their Twitter or Facebook, hey, come on over, my, my parents are going out. And all of a sudden it turns into a house wrecking party. So we put a lot of information on these types of profiles. Here we've got you know, on Jane Smith's name, address, phone number, date of birth, um, her photograph. All of it's linked together really nicely for people if they wanted to compromise her. On Facebook, today anyway, there's 256 different privacy settings. So you can do lots of different things to um, make yourself more private on Facebook, but there's a lot of categories of information that they accumulate about you. I think it's about 56 different categories. And that's a lot of information, and you really have to be on top of it. So you know, use those privacy settings, read them, understand what they're all about, and um, know that there are people out there that, um, and they may be commercial organizations, that are aggregating all that information and they can link it together depending on which website that you're using and putting information. Say you put some here and some there and some there. Well, a lot of times it can all be linked together. Linked so much that 87% of, of Americans can be linked by their zip, their gender, and their um, date of birth which is quite incredible, actually, because it's not a lot of information, but it's, it's uh, pretty identifiable. So say, for an example, you travel, you like to go to hotels to log on to Facebook. Again, you can ask for a secure setting. So notice it goes to HTTPS. That will help, um, I guess, get you a secure setting so that your lo log on or login is not going to be compromised or any sort of information that you put on and send to your friends is not going to be compromised from point A to point B. This is called a Google Alert. If you've ever been a victim of any kind of identity crime, uh, you've lost your wallet, your purse, you feel like there's some information that's gotten out about you, maybe online or your friends have posted too much about you, you're not sure. Um, this is something that you can do. It's free of charge. You go onto Google, uh, google.com slash alerts, and you can set up a Google alert so that what happens is you get the internet working for you. They will start sending you links, and of course you can check out the link to see what it's actually saying. Is that about you or is it a different Constable Kathy McDonald? Um, you, can, you can check that out. So you just go in, you can um, ask it to search images, news, um, blogs, and it'll look for any, any um, page on the internet that has your name on it or anything that you put in quotation marks. Now, if you have a name like Ann Brown or something like that, you may not want to do this. It's going to be a lot of hits. But uh, how often? As it happens, 
or maybe once a week, once a month, you know, once a day, however often you want to get that, uh, those hits back, those results back. And then your email. I'd always suggest that people have at least two, me two email addresses, a primary one for their friends and family, and then a secondary one for a Google Alert or for Facebook or for Gmail or something like that. So um, you want to always have at least two uh, emails anyway. Um, and try to keep them separated between friends and family and everything else. Because if, if you get too much, um, you know, spam or junk mail or somebody's starting to harass you or something like that, you can get rid of that one and start all over again. So, uh, yeah, so a Google Alert, good thing to do, especially for kids. Um, sometimes, you know, you just don't know that your kids have a fan club or that they've been, you know, their name's showing up in a newspaper up in Edmonton. So you just never know. Um, we often talk about passwords and how important they are. And the problem with passwords is people forget them. But they really are the keys to our kingdom. And if you think about all the passwords that you have to remember in your life, um, it's, it's a lot, and it's a lot to remember. And that's why we often use the same one on a whole bunch of different sites. Well, the bad guys know that. Criminals know that. And so if you get hacked, <coughs> if you get phished, if they find out what your, your uh, password is in one place, they will check a whole bunch of others, even though they don't know if you're a customer on those other ones. So they'll try eBay. They'll try PayPal because these are the common sites. There's maybe 10 that we all use, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter. They'll try them all. If they get into one of those, what they will do is they will send all of your contacts a note. And they will say, um, hey, uh, I'm stuck in a hotel somewhere. Please send or wire me some money at this address via Western Union or MoneyGram. And so uh, we want to really be sure that we're keeping track of our passwords Keep them strong, keep them hard to guess. Uh, don't give away, you know, um, easy to guess things such as your dog's name, your um, kid's names as a password. Use a combination of upper and lower special characters. So for an example, if you're using S, change that to a dollar sign. If you're using an I, make that into an exclamation mark. But make it easy for you to guess as, or to remember as well. And again, um, this is new, digital inheritance. Um, you know, leave your passwords. You never know uh, if your family's going to have to delete accounts. They're going to have to have access to certain places. So think about them as well. And that's the new thing now, digital inheritance, is adding your passwords to your estate planning. Um, just with that, I'm just going to mention really quickly, if you're carrying laptops around, they are a target. You want to limit the collection of data on the hard drive. Only take them out if you absolutely have to. Make it part of standard practice to put them in the trunk, keep them out of sight, because they definitely are a target, and they don't show up in pawn shops or anywhere else. They're gone. Uh, just uh, finish off, you know, um, this is more in a business setting, but having policy, reinforcing the policy if you're in a, you know, at work, uh, there's reason for doing things. Um, if you see people wandering through your hallways, how do you approach them? Ask your security department, how should I approach this person? It's always best to make eye contact, be friendly. Um, you want to say, you know, can I help you? You look lost. Because sometimes people will wander through these halls, they'll put a resume under their arm, and if you stop them, they'll say, oh, I'm looking for the HR department. Um, I'm looking for, and they'll look at names on doorways as they're going past. So those are the social engineers. They don't like to be seen. So that's why, you know, take a note of them, look them in the eye. They don't want to be seen. And then ask them, can I help you? They feel uncomfortable, and they'll probably leave pretty quick. You never want to take people at face value with just a business card, because it's easy enough to print those off. Um, again, card policy, tailgating policy. You're not being rude when you say, sorry, I can't let you in here. Um, you're going to have to use your own card. But it's really important, tailgaters, uh, they'll get into places. Again, they'll steal laptop computers, gym bags, jackets, those kinds of things. And then they will, again, take that information, and then they can sell that information to somebody up a little bit higher that's able to do identity crime. So that's sometimes the source of information. And I'm just going to finish off with, 
you know, we should all have firewalls, anti-spyware, phishing filters, spam blockers. Again, firewalls, antivirus, keep everything up to date. Um, you know, I mentioned that already, these other points. And these are the two credit bureaus that we have here in Canada. It's a good idea to do them at least once a year and possibly twice a year. Do a credit bureau check. You can do it online, by phone. Um, I'm not sure about email, but you can also do it by fax. There's a small fee for it, and it doesn't affect your rating um, if you do it yourself. And it will tell you who's been trying to acquire credit using your information. So it's a good idea to do it at least once a year. Uh, you don't have to do it with both of them. You can just do it once uh, with one of them. If you've ever been a, a victim of some type of crime where you've lost your wallet, um, you've had your wallet stolen, your laptop stolen, or whatever, get your police case number and put it on file at the credit bureau so that you are notified if somebody then goes out and commits some type of crime or tries to um, acquire some credit using your information. With that, I believe that is all. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.